recorded. So anyone who misses this, they can still catch it. All right. Until next time. All thank right. You. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Verkam, and I'm an attorney in Edison, New Jersey. And uh, um, I'm here right, to try to, uh, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes or so and, uh, you know, try to uh, update people on some of the things regarding wills, powers of attorney, probate, living wills. I'd say oftentimes I've got people will ask me, hey, Kenny, like, hey, why do I even need to have a will? I'm married. Uh, the stuff is, is joint. And I goes, well, that's not really doing planning that just hoping that one of the two of you live lives forever but you know for a lot of married people sometimes the more important document is the power of attorney because a will takes care of your assets if you pass away if there's no will automatically goes to the surviving uh spouse unless it's children from a prior relationship but if someone gets like uh, hurt injured whatever becomes incapacitated the your spouse has no, no legal right to do anything uh, let's see so um so let's talk about let's see uh uh, you know, what kind of what 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 bad things happen if someone does not have a will or the will was not properly um, uh, admitted to to pro, to, um, um, you know, sign whatever. Well, that means that all the children have to sign uh, a uh, what's called a renunciation uh, affidavit in front of a notary saying that we all agree upon uh, one person to be the administrator then that has to be uh, filed with the uh, surrogate for a uh, for a fee uh, if all the children don't sign a renunciation uh, agreeing upon who's going to be the administrator then a typically a complaint order show cause has to be filed in the Superior Court New Jersey uh, any you know we we love our Superior Court judges but anytime you're going to be have to be in front of a uh, Superior Court judge plan on spending like uh you know three four grand in court cost fees etc number two if there's no will or the will wasn't signed properly or prepared properly the uh, um person who's going to be the administrator has to take out what's called the surety bond what what is a what is a surety bond well a surety bond is a um, is a form where you are uh, um you know basically guaranteeing that you're not going to steal. But most people trust their kids or whoever is going to be the executor. If there's no will, um, then uh, this bond has to be taken out and some people can't even be bonded. A lady was in my office, like, uh, you know, on, you know, where there was no will. And I had to ask her the questions. Hey, you know, do you have a job? Uh, how's your credit? Because I've had people that they couldn't get, couldn't be bonded. Uh, next, let's see, uh, uh, if there's no will, state law determines who gets your assets, not you. And uh, more and more people are, are saying, listen, I'm not leaving an outright to my kids. My kids are already okay with their money. Uh, or like, do I have to leave it equally to my kids? And I'm going to touch upon that later on. Um, if someone has minor children, uh, a total stranger determines who gets custody of the kids, which is a judge in the superior court. Um, you know, by not meeting, you know, discussing it with an attorney, you lose sometimes the opportunity to, you know, make things easier. But uh, what we, the worst thing is that when there's no will, it also often causes fights, aggravations, sometimes lawsuits amongst the family. So when loved ones are grieving, there shouldn't be one more thing to, to aggravate them. So, okay, uh, think about doing your will. Don't be a putter off or don't be a putter off or just simply, okay, who do I not want to get my assets? Uh, the government, people I don't like. Who do I want to get my assets? People I like. Um, if someone has minor children, hey, who would not be the best person to raise those children? If Even if someone has like uh, children or grandchildren that are 20, 21 years old. You know, typically like uh, 18, 19 year olds don't do smart things with money. Uh, beware of online documents not prepared by an attorney. Um, you know, we had someone from the surrogate's office speak with us well, last year uh, where, you know, they said, you know, some of the problems that, uh, you know, we see all the time is not by documents prepared by an attorney, but someone that ran into the hospital room and had grandpa sign some kind of form and it was two people and it wasn't done right, etc. And uh, I see our, the, the boss, the the, the judge has joined us today. Wave, wave to wave to me, uh, sir. Okay, good. Just want to make sure you're listening. I got to be now. I got to be careful what I'm saying because, like, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, 
make sure that what I'm saying is, is correct. So uh, if anyone's taking notes, make sure you have a will, make sure it's a self-proving will. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's best to have professional, uh, you know, do things rather than just trying to, trying to wing it because, hey, you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars of assets often and your family's future. Um, when I had my first house, I tried to wing it and do my own electrical work. Well, that did not turn out good. I thought I could learn how to do it. I thought I was gonna burn the house down. Um, when I had my first house, I tried to do some plumbing work myself. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden I'm like, wait, wait, why am I trying to do stuff? Um, one of our, pa one of our, a gentleman came to see us and he had over a million dollars. And he kept on saying, Oh, you know, no, you know, I want to read more up on this. I want to read more up on this. And I said, Carl, you don't need to read anything on this. I went to law school. I passed the bar. I go to seminars. You know, I attend, you know, I've, I speak at seminars. I wrote a book on this. I've already read four years. Told them when I had a knee, need a knee surgery, I didn't read about how the doctor was doing the knee surgery. I just said, hey, um, you know, doctor, you've done this before. Do the, be do the best you can. Okay, so, and by the way, you know, the procedure for doing this like, uh, uh, has become much, much more easier because, you know, back in, you know, five, you know, four years ago, what we, what uh, the procedure was, you know, so, you know, someone would call up the law office and then they would make it, make an appointment. They take a half a day off of work and then the, uh, they'd be in the reception area writing stuff down. And, uh, you know, we realized, hey, that's kind of, that's the kind of the dumb way to do it. So, so uh, instead, what most attorneys try to do is email out a short questionnaire. And some of the people say, oh, I don't have, I'm older, I don't have email. I goes, well, listen, I, do, I'm sure you, uh, do, your, do your kids have email or do you have a friend that's gonna help, help you out? Because, um, you know, the old system was, uh, I couldn't read people's handwriting, we were spelling things wrong. Then people were not, cr correctly reading the documents ahead of time, then they were signing documents with people's names spelled incorrectly. So instead, typically what most attorneys will do, they will email out a short questionnaire. Um, person types up the information and then, um, you know, the attorney will call the person up and say, hey, this is what I, I suggest. And, uh, you know, once they pay the attorney, the attorney prepares the documents. We're trying to be as paperless as possible. And um, let's see, uh, um, so, uh, and, you know, because, you know, it's, it's kind of easier. Most people would rather fill out the forms in the comfort of their home and they can decide ahead of time before speaking to the clients. I've had people come into our office, you know, live, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, they're arguing in, in my office or in the reception area over, what they want. Well, it's kind of should be decided ahead of time. Okay. So, and um, by the way, um, believe it or not, New Jersey did away with some of the taxes. Wow. Who, could, who thought the New Jersey would do that? Uh, they did away with the New Jersey estate tax. When I was first practicing, every penny over $600,000 was subject to an estate tax, unless it was going to the spouse. Well, now, uh, unless it's uh, more than $12.5 million, there's no estate tax. Uh, for inheritance tax, there's no tax if it's going to children, to spouse, parents, grandchildren, stepchildren. Um, if it's going to any charities, there's no tax. If it's going to brothers or sisters, the first 25,000 is tax free after that. Then there is a tax of 11%. Again, no tax if it's going to bona fide charities. Everyone else got to pay 15%. So what are you typing up for the attorney? Well, you type it in your name, you're typing in who's executor one, who's executor two. For the people that uh, don't have email, you know, uh, I don't do any documents, of course, until I speak to them personally, because I have to be aware of conflicts of interest and making sure it's what they want, not, you know, what their kid wants or whoever I like, typed up the form for them. Okay, executors, let's say, uh, I always say there should be an executor one and executor two. We don't want to have joint executors because it, for a lot of estates, it creates twice as much work. Um, 
They could be twins living together in the same house, but that means two people have to sign the paperwork for the surrogate. Two people have got to sign a listing for you know any like a house to be sold. Two people got to sign the contracts. Two people got to you know go to a closing. Um, many banks, if there's co-executors, require both executors to sign sign everything. So you know, uh, and that's for people to get along. We I've been involved with estates where. Brother, there was brothers, they couldn't agree upon what color the sky was. Brother number one would say the, the sky is blue. The other one would say, no, it's gray. You're stupid. Have you always been stupid, you idiot? And this is what they're saying in front of the judge, you, you idiot. And I, you know, and I remember the judge saying you know, to these brothers, he goes, fellas, you know, you, you had fun times when you were a kid. You probably went camp with your parents, went on vacation. Why don't you fellas go and have a cup of coffee and, you know, uh, and leave the attorneys out of it? You know, just like I had a mediation in Monmouth County last month and I told the mediator, he goes, listen, let's see, um, there's there's like uh, the executor and then his kids and, his, and the executor's ex-wife, who's the mother. I think we could probably resolve it if the mother is not in the room. If the mother's in the room, uh, everyone's gonna go to war. And fortunately, the mom wasn't there and at one point, uh, the son said to the mediator, hey, can we go and talk to, like, uh, dad on our own? And I'm like, oh, th you know, thank you. Anyway, so well, there's there's one captain of the ship, and it's best to have, you know, one person in charge, not co-executors. Okay. Uh, we no longer ask details on, you know, account number, stuff like that, because things change. We do ask about real estate. What real estate does someone have in New Jersey? And do they have real estate in other states? Because although, uh, you know, someone passes away and is a resident of New Jersey, their will covers their New Jersey assets and they would have to be do an ancillary probate in the other state. And if they have that property in Florida, New York, or California, I recommend that they have uh, put the property into a trust. And I'll touch upon that uh, uh, later on. Let's see. So we do ask for, you know, what, you know, basically you'll, you know, approximate amount of your assets. I don't need details on the amounts. I do need more details if it's a probate case. Then we go over, okay, who's who Who gets your stuff? And think about if that person um, passes, who will get that person's share? Now, but also remember, if you're taking notes, certain assets do not pass under the will. They're not non-probate assets. And those are assets that pass by title. So a common example of that, if it's a house's own husband and wife, automatically goes to the survivor. Will can't change that. Bank accounts, if it's POD, payable upon debt, joint tenancy, automatically goes to the survivor. Those pass by title. Certain assets pass by contract. So think of like IRA, 401k, life insurance, annuities, anything that has a direct beneficiary. The will cannot change that. Um, you know, so, and if someone's not sure, it's a good idea to get a printout, not even look up online, you know, get a printout of who the beneficiary is so you can make sure. Okay, now, um, who's your beneficiaries? Well, let's see, it. it is your right to decide who gets your stuff. Um, the only, like, uh, law is you can't leave the spouse penniless or, you know, if the spouse wants to elect against the will if they're not, you know, like, uh, you know, given sufficient amount. Uh, but uh, other than that, it's your right to do with it what you want. You know, uh, you know, like crazy ladies get criticized for leaving their like, uh, uh, money to their dogs or cats. But hey, when I know when I get home tonight, my dog is going to be so happy to see me come running up wagging a, wagging a tail. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would barely get a, uh, a high dad when I came in. I'd say, uh, so, uh, I'd say, um, uh, and something else that some people put in their wills, like, uh, you know, a clause that says, listen, like, uh, um, I, I, you know, I, for my pet, I ask that uh, the, the pet not be put down right away, but there be some money put to take care of the pet because I don't want, I don't want the first thing the executor do for a, uh, a healthy seven-year-old dog is bring the dog to the, uh, to the pound because they don't want to have to deal with it or you'll put the dog down. Okay, now, uh, it is your right to do with what you want. You know, more and more people are not leaving it outright to kids or in equal shares. 
uh, last year. A client goes, do I have to leave everything to my uh, children equal shares? He goes, no, it's your right to do with it. What do you want? And he goes, what do you have? What do you have in mind? You know, what's your concern? He goes, well, one of my uh, one of my kids uh, lives on the West Coast. We don't hear much from him. I goes, well, hold on. Let me ask you a question. I go, did you get a card or a call on Mother's Day, on Christmas, or your birthday? The lady says, no. He goes, why would you leave this guy anything? We don't leave him a dollar. We don't leave him a penny. We don't give a reason. I leave nothing to, period. Let's see. Uh, if you pass, we still have to send that notice to probate to anyone that would have inherited if there was no will. But again, why reward someone that wasn't there to help, doesn't care, etc.? And also in my experience, that person you know that wasn't around helping is usually the biggest troublemaker in these probate cases because they're right away they're like where's my money where's my money um i've had people on the other side that they were written out of the will and uh, you know they wanted to quote challenge the will and i would say okay i see dad died two months ago when's the last time you you were with dad or with mom you know and they would say not for years Okay, uh, what grounds do you have to uh, challenge the will? And I'm not asking you to legal. Why do you think, well, because I wasn't left, uh, you know, a fair portion. He goes, okay, but I would have to present something to right now. Judge Daly's our probate judge. And he goes, well, what do you have to show that you were, not, not that you think you were cheated, but if you weren't, if you didn't have contact with mom or dad for three or four years, uh, what's, what's, I had that case last year where grandma didn't leave anything to the grandkids and file, you know, they, they got someone to file a complaint or to show cause to challenge the will, but same thing, judge, you know, you got, you know, the question is, okay, you know, uh, grandpa died in 2012. You didn't visit grandma 2013, 2014, 2015, up to when she died in 2021. Why shouldn't you get anything? So think about who do you want to get your stuff? Some people also have what's called specific bequests in their will. What a specific bequest is, is you're giving specific amounts of money or a specific asset to a specific person or entity. So sometimes the ladies will say, I want my jewelry to go to my daughter, my granddaughter, because my son will just bring it to cash for gold. He goes, what do you give me for this junk? Some of the men are sportsmen, they have firearms, they, they, they leave it to someone that has a uh, bona fide firearms permit. Otherwise, like, uh, you know, we gotta call the police and say, okay, take these away because they can't be given to someone who doesn't have a firearms permit. Some people leave uh, an amount of money to a charity. And I say it's better to leave an amount of money than a percentage because whenever you leave money to a charity, the attorney general is, uh, has to get involved. And if you put down, you know, for example, I leave $10,000 to X, provided my estate is more than, you know, $300,000, and it's more than that, uh, then when the attorney general gets involved after the will is probated, the attorney general just needs to see proof that um, the money was is being paid, but otherwise the attorney general's office is gonna require an accounting and some, and then, Sometimes the charity wants an accounting. So that be, makes it, you know, I, we love our charities. I mean, in my will, I said, okay. And, you know, I looked at, you know, what, what are some of the things that gave me joy when I was younger? Okay. I left uh, five grand to University of Scranton varsity uh, cross country team because I had a lot of fun with those guys. And that way they can buy some new uniforms. I left five grand to the, uh, uh, St. Thomas Bishop Bar, like, uh, you know, cross country team, because usually the cross country track people are at the end of money, like where to buy uniforms, football gets most of the money. You know, I left some money to my, like, uh, my grammar school, um, you know, sports, sports program. Uh, so, um, you know, so those are some examples of specific bequests. Some people, you know, again, uh, but you know, if it's going to a bona fide charity, then there's no inheritance tax. Uh, but if it's just some, like, uh, has to be a 501 you know, uh, C3 type charity. Um, let's see. And also, if you're leaving it to a charity, sometimes it's a good idea to look uh, 
on that charity's website to get the specific language to say who it should it should go to, because like in Monmouth County there was litigation uh, where uh, the person basically left money to an entity, but there was two competing entities and it had to go. They had to spend a lot of money to go in front of the judge, and I remember the probate judge and. Uh, um, you know, Monmouth County, I got Judge Gomer, you know, when we chatted on a, uh, on a matter, he goes, you know, see, they should have went, you know, Mr. Vercamer, they should have went to your seminar because they could have been more specific on who on who it is. You know, if you just leave money to, like, American Cancer Society, well, there's different entities of the American Cancer Society. Also, make sure it's, you know, some people, you know, that we support veterans, I'll leave money to the Wounded Warriors. Well, if you went to Google and typed in Wounded Warriors, there, there's, there's five different entities that claim that they are the official wounded warrior like uh, fund or found or foundation. All right. Um, if you don't want to leave money to, or anything to anyone, I make no bequest to. That's kind of the reverse specific bequest. And think about it. sometimes we don't leave money to people outright, not because we don't like them, but because they would not be able to manage money. So. Um, when there's minors, we usually say, hey, they don't get any money. It's put into a trust. They get some when they're 22, 25, and 30. However, uh, um, as much money as is needed can be used to pay for college, maintenance, support, etc. More and more people are leaving the money to their grandkids rather than their own kids because they say, hey, my own kids have, you know, already have a house. You know, they're comfortable. They would just go off, off and buy a boat or a luxury car. And, my, you know, they'll say, my kids have no idea what it's going to cost to send their kids to college uh, down, the, down the road. Sometimes we don't leave money, you know, it's a second marriage situation. So in, instead of leaving money outright to the spouse, we set up a, 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 te- a spousal trust, a testimonial trust within the will. Sometimes it could be a kid or beneficiary that has um, issues. Um, they could have, you know, alcohol issues, drug issues, financial issues. So we set up a test, uh, a testamentary trust in the will, and then a different person that like, uh, in the family holds the money and uses to pay for their rent for their car, you know, medical bills, etc. Um, if someone has a child with special needs, and it's important to set up a special needs trust because we don't want that person to lose their their eligibility for what they're getting. Uh, Let's say guardians, there's a guardian one and a guardian two when there's like a, um, minor children. There's a trustee, trustee one, it can be the same person, it can be, di- it can be different people. Um, make sure it is a self-proving will. Um, under the prior law, um, person signed and two witnesses, but then like uh, when the person died, one of the witnesses typically had to be located um, to like sign paperwork to say that uh, uh, that they were a witness. And I remember years ago up in Bergen County, the surrogate required a, a, the person sign an affidavit. Well, we went to the witness and the per- witness goes, yeah, yeah, I can do it. My fee's $500. He goes, $500? We're not paying you $500. The lady goes, well, they get the other witness. Well, she's dead. Yeah, my fee's $500. When the law was changed, self-proving will, the person signs, two witnesses sign, the attorney or notary signs, then there's some other language like that was like taken from the uniform uh, probate code, um, person signs again, two witnesses, the attorney or notary, that way the witnesses don't have to be located and it makes it as easy as possible. Uh, the old time law- old time wills, the old time lawyers did it the old way. I knew a law office that was still doing self not doing self-proving wills, you know, up to seven years ago. And I remember running into, you know, the attorney at a uh, um, um, bar conference and I said, hey, you know, you guys, you guys don't do self, you guys are going to get in trouble for that. You know, you're not really doing it the best way. And he, the attorney said at the time, well, if someone wants a self-proving will, we will we'll do it for him. I goes, people that live in Carteret and Avenel don't know what self-proving wills is, probably you know, 90% of the attorneys don't know what self-proving wills are, you know, because, you know, you know, attorneys now are trying to be more specialized in what, in what they do. Uh, so again, the cheap things that you see online are oftentimes not self-proving wills. Um, okay. After the will is signed, the will is your property. It's not the, you know, not the attorney's property. And, um, 
you know, almost you know, 18 years ago, the Supreme Court had a directive just to say, listen, the, you know, these are property of the client. And if the attorney is going to keep it, then they should be safe keeping it. I have not kept an original will uh, in my office, you know, since that came out, and I returned all the original wills. But you know, uh, you know, so um, where should the where should you put the original will? Well, where the executor can get to it. Most people just buy a uh, a fireproof box from Costco or you know Staples, someplace like that, and uh, put it under the bed with uh, stuff that they don't. No one's going to want to steal. I'd say. You don't want to put in a safe deposit box because, um, you know, don't don't assume or guarantee that the executor can get into the safe deposit box. Uh, what happened in uh, March and April of 2020? The banks locked their doors. You know, so good luck trying to get, you know, and even, even now when the banks are open, well, if you need a power of attorney and you need a, li a, a living will, on an emergent basis, the bank is not going to open up their doors on Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning for you to get it. And also, you know, you know, now let's say the you know the banks are concerned about the banks and not about you people out there in like uh, TV land. Um, you know, see, so in, you know they're a lot of times difficult to deal with. So the quick story about safe deposit boxes, you know, a decade or so ago, my dad says, hey, listen, I put you on, you know, uh, I put you on the safe deposit box. It has your kids bonds from when they were young. And uh, here's the key. OK, good. So one day I said, you know what? You know, I don't even know what they have in bonds. Let me go. To, let me go to the bank now. Uh, the banks change, you know, get merge and get taken over. So what was first Fidelity became First Union, then Countrywide, but then becomes Wells Fargo. Very difficult bank to deal with. I go there with my ID, with the key for the uh, um, safe deposit box, and the Wells Fargo people goes, "Oh, you're not on, you're not on the uh, box." He goes, "No, no, listen. If my dad, the engineer, says he came to this bank and filled up papers, I know he did it." He's not like some old guy that gets lost driving to a shop, right? Uh, but, the, you know, the bank then says, well, just have one of your parents come in. Okay, my mom has to drive up from Jackson, and uh, they bring her in. They goes, okay, uh, Mrs. Uh, B, we just need you to sign some papers here. Okay, okay, yeah, Kenneth is now on the account. Kenneth, you can go. We just got to go over a couple other things uh with with uh, Mrs. V. Okay, fine. I find out this bank is trying to sell a 70 plus year old lady a 30 year annuity, which is, you know, kind of crooked um, and shifty. Okay, so again, um, you know, make uh, only the original will can be admitted to probate. The circuit's going to touch upon that. I, I tell people, you know, the photocopy uh, is like, you know, if you, you know, is like saying to the bank, uh, hey, I lost my $20 bill, but here's a photocopy. Let me have a new one. Uh, so if you, my rule of thumb is if you can't find your original will in a week, sign a new one. The, uh, having a will done is going to, you know, cost you anywhere between like, you know, you know, $400, $600 a person, um, you know, per document. But it's one of the best buys because it saves thousands down the road and it saves aggravation. Okay. Um, now, um, my mother-in-law used to, uh, you know, call me up every other year and she would say, oh, I want to come in and get a trust done. I want to come in and get a trust. And I would say to her, uh, were you watching Susie Orman on TV? And she says, oh, yes. And he goes, well, Susie Orman is exactly right. If you live in New York, California, Florida, where the probate process is a nightmare. You know, I'm like, uh, you know, we're doing probate on a simple condo in Florida. It's only worth about, you know, 220 grand. And the court costs and legal fees are over $12,000 in less than a year growing. I'd say, don't get ripped off by trust salesmen that say in New Jersey, you need a trust, you need a trust. Because I, I always ask her, why do you think you need a trust other than Susie Orman said you need one or your friend in Florida has one? Uh, a trust, a, a revocable trust does not protect money from taxes. A revocable trust does not protect from Medicaid. Um, some people talk about, oh, the privacy of a trust. Well, 
most people are leaving their monies to their kids and not like, you know, like, you know, you know, strangers. So why, why do you care who's getting your, your money? Um, there is a, some people want to protect their assets from Medicaid. That's called an irrevocable uh, uh, trust. And uh, so the, the assets are no longer owned by you. It's owned by the trust. You can't be the main trustee in five years. Got to go by. Right. So that is that is wills 101, trust 101. And by the way, for anyone like listening, uh, uh, I often say like, some people are ha can, get, can get free wills. I put it in the chat button. Some you know many of the companies have legal plans that uh, it's covered. You know uh, you know um, you know you know so uh, some of the biggest legal plans are MetLife, IROG Legalese. And if anyone's listening, like uh, I tell people, typically you charge a two hundred dollar estate planning consult. But if someone contacts us within thirty days of the program, then we waive the consult. Okay, let me talk uh, briefly on because I think I'm almost over my thirty minutes. Pav attorney, Pav attorney. A will takes care of your assets if you pass away. The Pav attorney is the document where you're giving the ability to someone that you trust to be able to like act on your behalf legally. A typically a spouse, a child, someone that you trust, trust, trust. Um, so, live, will takes care of your assets if you die. Five attorneys, like, you know, uh, while you're alive. Um, and uh, so you're giving the power to, you know, again, this person you trust, and they can use it, go to a bank, etc. Now, I said the word go to a bank. And this is another reason why um, you, um, you know, you have a professional do it. Some of the banks were giving people a hard time, uh, you know, um, in these financial places where, oh, well, that form, that power of attorney wasn't done in our form, so you've got to go and have it done in our form. Well, the person's already in the hospital. It's too late. Well, so the legislature came up with, uh, um, amended the living, I mean, the power of attorney statute, and the bank has to honor it, but it has to make reference to the section two of PL 1991. The uh, actual statute is 46 colon 2B-11. And I'm pretty sure these cheap things that you find online don't make reference to New Jersey statute. Don't believe where it says valid in any state. Um, a power of attorney that's done in New Jersey is not gonna be found valid in another state. Um, and I also recommend a new power of attorney be signed every five years. The power of attorney is either effective right away and stays effective only uh, even if someone becomes uh, disabled and incapacitated. That's called the durable power of attorney, meaning it stays durable even if someone like, uh, you know, becomes ill, like, you know, incapacitated, etc. A springing power of attorney only springs into effect if someone is becomes legally disabled pursuant to the uh, legislative like, uh, definition of disability. Let's see. My client, uh, Fred, last year goes, Kenny, that's legal terms. I'm a carpenter. I don't understand legal stuff. Explain to me in carpenter terms this stuff on the power of attorney. I said, okay, you're, you're listing your son on the power of attorney. It's effective right away. He can steal all your money right away. If it's effective only upon disability, he has to get a, uh, a note from a doctor before he steals your money. Knowing that you trust your son. He goes, oh, I trust my son with my life. Listen, take my advice, make it effective right away. Because when it's not effective right away, we see you know, it creates more problems because the bank's going to say, well, how do we, well, you got to know from a doctor. How do we know that the person's like, uh, you know, uh, not better now? So don't use cheap forms. The last uh, form I'm going to talk about is the Living Will Advanced Directive uh, Medical Proxy. The e it's, it's easier for me just to say Living Will. The living will is a document, f not for you, but for your family, because as long as you can talk, you can you make your own decisions, you're the captain of the ship. The uh, living will is really for that document that, you know, uh, you know, it's, you know, it, the, the end is near, you can't talk for yourself, you're in a coma, irreversible condition, and you don't, uh, you want to be able to tell the doctors in writing when you signed it in 2022, doctor, I don't want to have stuff done. I don't want to be like, uh, you know, pain prolonged, etc. That's it. And again, it's important because like, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, 
many people have been in that position where, you know, the doctor asks them the ultimate question. I remember when the doctors asked me the ultimate question on someone that I was the power of attorney, but the person didn't, didn't sign a living will. And the doctors then go to me, okay, should we remove life support today? And, you know, I said, you know, geez, I, I feel bad. You know, I know what the right decision is for someone who's 92 years old that's not going to open up their eyes again. But, you know, you hate to be the one to say, yeah, doc, yeah, go, go turn the switch off. Yeah, today's a good day. I couldn't even do it for my like, uh, my prior dog when my dog was so sick and I already spent $16,000 in vet bills, you know, because it's so difficult to do it for the loved one. So make the decision for them ahead of time so they don't have to stress. So. In the living will advance directive, like we copied some of the language from the medical society. So, um, section A, fluids and nutrition's to be withheld or provided. 85% of the people say, listen, if there's no hope for me, I don't want to be on feeding tubes, etc." Section B, artificial machines, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, etc. 99% of the people say no. Now you're also though, typically in our living wills, you're having someone that's your medical uh, power of attorney. And uh, we've, we've updated our forms over the time to include language for HIPAA, Pulse, the, the New Jersey Caregivers Act. You know, but you also wanna be, if, if you don't want some, you know, it doesn't have to be your agent, the same person as your executor. Sometimes you could have a family member that is more, you know, knows more about medical or might be less emotional. You know, you know, so for example, I remember years ago when I was first married and you're all lovey-dovey and I'm redoing my documents and my wife says, oh, if something happened to you, I could never let them pull the plug. Because when you're first married, you're all like happy, whatever. Then like 25 years later, she goes, wait a minute. So if you get dead, I get $850,000 tax-free. I can quit my job and never work again. Well, you know, let's, let's pull the plug now. Well, I'm not quite dead yet. So now we also have a, a clause in there like uh, for organ donors, like uh, because we just want now the um, for the power of attorney. It is a good idea to just have it scanned afterwards and then forward it to you know. First of all, you email it to yourself, but email it to your financial advisor, your accountant, banker, life insurance, anyone that you have deal with your finances, so that uh, they know that it is it is there. For your living will, you want to you know uh, scan it, email it to yourself, your family, but also to your doctor. That way, that way it's there, so that someone is not all of a sudden, you know, looking for it. You know, you know, you know, if someone is hospitalized and the doctor says, you know, uh, also with the le the the living will, you're putting someone in charge. You know, again, so that the kid who wasn't helpful, who wasn't around. When like you know, mom, dad, you know, like whoever, is is in the hospital. It's the end. They don't walk into the room and start trying to say, "Okay, I'm in charge now," because the answer is no. You know, when this document was done back in 2022, they selected this person, so that person's the captain of the ship. Um, it's also important that you know, a lot of times we talk about people that are uh, are married, etc., their family. It's almost more important if someone is not married without kids to have these documents because otherwise there's no one. And if there's no power of attorney, there's no nothing, then um, someone would have to spend the money and go through a complicated superior court guardianship, which is expensive, a sad proce you know, procedure. And, uh, and, and if you want to sell a house, then you also have to get uh, appraisals, etc. So. I'd say, have, uh, so again, if someone's not married, think, okay, who don't I want to get my assets? The government. Who do you like? You know, who deserves it? Not because they think they're getting a windfall. And that's who you want to leave, leave your, th your things to. And uh, there was a little lady that says, okay, I'm leaving it to uh, these couple neighbors that were nice to me over the years. I'm leaving some to my hairdresser. And again, not because, you know, these people weren't nice to the old lady because they wanted to get money because they were nice people. And uh, the client says, why should, you know, why should I leave it to some cousins on the West Coast I haven't seen in 30 years that, you know, I don't know. So think about, you know, 
Uh, it's not about, you know, doing planning. It's trying to make it easy. You work hard for your money. Don't have it caught up in, like, you know, other expenses. Okay, so I'd say I am not a tech person. Uh, so my name is Ken Burkham, and I'm